Namo Buddhaya, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. And thank you all for this opportunity to share. And we are going to go in depth into this most popular of sutras. And I will go through it slowly so that um, we can understand it and benefit from it. You have to realize that in going through the Heart Sutra, we will literally be going through the entire spectrum of the Buddha Dharma. And as I said, um, we will have a little break in between and I will try to go through slowly and hopefully all of us will benefit. Now, it's called Prashna Paramita Hidaya in Sanskrit. And Sing Ching is probably the most popular name. And of course in English, the Heart Sutra. But there are many, many myths which surrounds this sutra. And I would like to also go through that. Now I'm approaching the Heart Sutra from a completely non-sectarian manner, we will just, or rather I will just look at it as Buddha Dharma. And this very popular Heart Sutra or Sing Ching, the version that we are using today is actually edited by the Venerable Xuan Zhang. Now, most of us are familiar with the Venerable Xuan Zhang of the CUT fame but there was a book that was written in the Ming Dynasty as a novel almost a thousand years or more after the actual person had lived. Now, when it was Xuan Chang did amazing amount of work in translation, but his greatest contribution to the Buddha Sasana was actually in editing the Heart Sutra. And you will realize I use the word edit rather than translate, and I will explain into it later on. Now the Heart Sutra in Chinese has only 260 Chinese characters. And in these 260 Chinese characters, it collates the Buddha's teachings on how to be enlightened, how to be awakened, covering a wide spectrum from insight meditation to the khandhas, to the concept of non-self, dependent origination, four noble truth, emptiness, and finally, how to be fully liberated. Prachna Paramita Hidaya cannot be translated into Chinese. And Xuan Chang had strict guidelines in his translation work. And one of those guidelines is that if something cannot be precisely translated, then it should remain untranslated, but transliterated, leaving it to future generations to figure out its meaning. So Prachna Haramita become Poro Polo Mi To Sing. The heart here doesn't refer to the physical heart, not, not to this physical heart beating, but it refers to the core or the innermost aspect of the perfection, which is paramita of wisdom, prashna. Prashna means wisdom, panya in Pali, and paramita means perfect or supreme. So as you know, those of you who have studied some Pali, the language structure in Pali and Sanskrit is like Malay. It goes the other way around. So Prachna Paramita Hidaya is the heart of perfect wisdom, the opposite way. Sing, of course, in Chinese also refers to our mind, how we think. And here Prachna Paramita refers to the perfect way of seeing the nature of reality. Now, not many people are aware that there are no Sanskrit manuscripts which titles what we today call Sing Ching 
as a sutra. Not even the early Chinese translations. They were all titled as Dharani or Zhou Yi or Zhou Jing. And a Dharani is like a mnemonic device to help memorization. And hence, it cannot be too long. And the Venerable Xuan Zhang appears to be the first person after he edited it to actually call this text a sutra, a thing. Before this, it was not known as a sutra. So myth number one, if someone is to say, oh, you are studying a Mahayana Sutra, that is actually wrong because Sing Ching is not even a Sutra. That's why it does not have the beginning and the end that is typical of all Sutras. Now, Xuan Chang was a historical person. He's born, we are not too sure of the exact year. Some sources say 596, some sources say 602, some say 600 year of the common era. But he was a historical figure and he became very famous because of his 17 years overland journey to India. Some of you in this audience itself had been on journeys tracing where he went. After spending so many years in India studying, he brought back 657 Sanskrit texts. And his personal interest is actually in meditation. And he was very interested in the Yogacara or the consciousness only school of Buddhism. The journey to the West Sea Uti, on the other hand, is a Chinese novel written more than a thousand years after the historical figure in the Qing and in the Ming dynasty. And it was roughly based on Xuan Chang's journey, but it added many, many mythical elements that made it an interesting novel. And in fact, it's considered one of the four great novels of China. But it is also very interesting because the author of the novel incorporated Buddhist concepts. Sun Wukong, for example, whom you and I probably know from childhood as that monkey, actually represents anger, restlessness in the mind of Xuan Zhang. While Zhu Ba Jie, the big fat lazy fellow who was very lustful, lecherous, represents our greed, our lust. And Sa Jing or Sa Wu Jing represents ignorance, delusion. So they can be used as metaphors in teaching because these, although in this novel were put as characters, could actually just represent our defilements. Now in his youth, Xuan Chang obtained a Chinese version of what is now called the Mahaprasna Paramita Great Enlightening Dharani. He got it in Sichuan from an elderly monk. And this was considered the primordial heart sutra. But it was not even called a sutra, as I said. It's actually a dharani, a mnemonic device. And it is very likely an extract from Kumara Jiva, who lived in the 400s, translation of the large Prachna Paramita Sutras, which are more than 500 chapters. So this primordial, on, at that time, will be considered a very early version, had sections which are completely similar to Kumara Jiva's work in translating the large Prachna Paramita Sutra. And so because of this, it was assumed that Kumara Jiva translated this early version. Nowadays, it's debatable. They think it's likely not Kumara Jiva, but someone else who extracted it from Kumara Jiva's work. And that text itself, that primordial text, helped Xuan Chang overcome his many, many mental difficulties as he was journeying towards the West crossing deserts, mountains, blizzards, etc. Until the very end, this remained one of his favorite texts. Apparently, even on his deathbed, he was reciting this Sing Ting. Now, as Xuan Chang was very well versed with the Prashna Paramita corpus, 
he himself translated after checking three different versions of the Prashna Parameter text, he himself translated one single one. So he was kind of an expert in the Prashna Parameter text. He made some corrections to this primordial short text, significantly changing the beginning and adding a closing line. And in this process, he created the most popular and probably the most important Buddhist text of the Northern tradition, chanted by millions for the last 1,000 over years. Now, for us, it is important to know that Xuan Chang was firstly a meditator. He went to India seeking answers to questions with regards to the Yogacara school. And secondly, Xuan Chang is unique in that he was educated in both the Southern and Northern traditions. Now, the earliest extant text of Xuan Chang's Heart Sutra is a stone steel carved in stone, literally, dated 661 CE, three years before Xuan Chang passed away. And this is near to Beijing. Now, the Heart Sutra is a map. It's brilliantly structured to apply the Buddha's teachings to guide us in our practice. It is not words taken verbatim from the Buddha. It is a summary of the entire Dhamma, covering both the Northern and Southern traditions. And it's a highly condensed contemplation guide. Its aim is to generate insights to shatter our strongest and most beloved delusions. And oftentimes, a single Chinese character would represent an entire teaching. Hence, first, to understand it will require basic knowledge of the Dhamma. And second, once you translate it into another language, it loses much of its essence. There is also much within these 260 words which actually challenges your understanding of the Dhamma. And this is what I hope to be able to do in the following two hours. So I've asked you all to print it out because I think you will need it as I go along because I don't want you to get lost. Now, if there is any person who is reading the Heart Sutra for the first time, it sounds absolutely crazy because it just keeps on saying, no, no, no. If one is trained in Buddhism, it sounds even crazier because it appears to negate everything that you have learned. But all these are for a purpose, as you will see. They are all designed for a purpose. I have broken it into eight sections, the English translation here. And I also hope you have printed it out because each section deals with a different aspect of the Dhamma, literally guiding us, helping us to break our delusions. For example, you begin by insight meditation, looking within to see the emptiness of the self. And then you go step by step into phenomena, into concepts, and then applying it, the next four, how to apply that in our daily lives so that you can be awakened and so that you can live without suffering. I will go through all this literally character by character. But before we begin, please drink your cup of tea, empty it so that it may be filled. This is an important teaching because if you come with a lot of preconceived ideas, then it is going to be very hard to share this. So please drink your tea now, empty your cup so that it may be filled. Now, on the right-hand side of the screen, you will see the Heart Sutra in Chinese. And we have to keep on referring to it because words there are so important. But the first three words itself is crucial. As I told you, 
Xuanzang altered the beginning of that primordial text. And in altering the beginning, he literally redirected the entire focus of these 260 words. The first three characters say, Guan Zi Zai. Guan Zi Zai. Guan is to observe mindfully. I understand most of you are from KL, so you'll probably be speaking Cantonese. In JB, everybody speaks Mandarin. In KL, you will speak in Cantonese. Guan in Cantonese is Gun. So if you chant the Heart Sutra in Cantonese, it's Gun Ji Joy. To observe, to contemplate. So what do you contemplate? If I don't ask Sister Lina, can you contemplate? Her question is contemplate what? And here is to contemplate yourself. Look into your own mind. Now. Look into your own mind at every moment as you cultivate this path of the Buddha Dharma. Guan Zi Zai. So right mindfulness in every moment is needed in our pursuit of truth and perfect wisdom. And as I said, Xuan Chang's brilliance is evident in his choice of words. Because in walking the path, the understanding of the Dhamma is not theoretical. That is only the background. It must be direct observation of our seeing the mind. Guan Zi Zai. The second and third characters in combination, Zi Zai, Ji Zai. Ji Zai. Zi Zai means unbounded Ji Zai, a state of ease, freedom, happiness. You are freed. You're no longer bounded by human and divine bondages. Zi Zai. And the first three characters, if you take it, in context of Guan Zi Zai, in Chinese, it represents a Velokiteshvara Bodhisatta, which again will shock many of you here, because your first question will be, why is it not Guan Si Yin? Why is it Guan Zi Zai? Well, a Velokiteshvara Bodhisatta, whether you call by Guan Zi Zai or Guan Si Yin, is the embodiment of compassion. Cultivation cannot be just one way. Cultivation includes living life with loving kindness and compassion. So you can see the very first three characters itself teaches so much. Now, Xuan Chang disagreed with the earlier translations of Avalokiteshvara as Guan Shi Yin. He disagreed. He translated L-O-K in Avalok as looking, not listening. He did not want this Guan Shi Yin to be in here. And so he changed it to Guan Zi Zai. And in this context in the Heart Sutra, Guan Zi Zai used here refers to looking at the ultimate nature of things. You are looking into yourself, into your own mind to see the ultimate nature of things. Now, very often you will see images like that, either in painting, in sculpture. This I took when I visited the uh, Asian Museum in Singapore. And I thought it was really very nice because it really depicts a person who is in a zi zai ji zai posture. This is called Zi Zai Guan Yin Xiang. And it is a very iconic Zi Zai image because it illustrates the state of ease, freedom, and happiness, boundlessness. Now you will know what I mean when I say I need two hours to share this sutta in depth because the first three characters have already taken us 15 minutes. But you need to understand this. 
a sister in Indonesia wrote to me that she has been chanting the Heart Sutra for years and years and did not realize Quan Zi Zai meant looking into your mind now. Now in the Chinese Agamas, which are the equivalent of the Pali Canon, the Nikayas, Zi Zai, when associated with Buddhist monks or the Buddha, invariably means freedom, emancipation, and the other shore. In that context, it has only one meaning. Emancipation, freedom, unbound. The late venerable would say, the late chief venerable would say, freed from human and divine bondages. As I said, words that cannot be translated will not be translated. Bodhisattva is another word which cannot be translated. And so it is transliterated Bo as Pu, Sattva as Sat. And so you have the word Pu, Sat. Bodhi, of course, means enlightenment. Sattva means the being who is intent on achieving enlightenment. So Pu Sa is Sister Jennifer, the being who is intent on achieving enlightenment. All right. So the Dhamma shows us the way, but we need to apply these teachings so that our body, speech, and mind is in line with the Buddha Dhamma. Hence, you will see Quan Zi Zai Pu Sa Sing Shen Po Re Po Lo Mi To Shi Sing Shen Sing Shen means Sing in Cantonese Hang Walk Shen Sum Profound Deep Sister Jennifer, you don't need to take a photograph. I'm giving you the whole set of notes. You have the whole set of notes, so you don't have to take a photograph. Sing Shen Hang Walk Literally walk. Shen, shen lu, deep, profound. So it is only when we walk deeply, profoundly, living these teachings, then you will walk this way. And what are you trying to walk? Go back again to the first line. Xing shen, po ro, po lo, mi to shi. When you are walking the path of perfect wisdom, when you walk this path of perfect wisdom deeply, what will you see when you look yourself? You will see Wu Yin is the five khandas, the five aggregates. All right, again, this would require basic knowledge of the Dhamma, but I will explain it. Zhao Jian Wu Yin Jie Kong. You will see that your five khandas is empty. Zhao Jian, clearly see, illuminate. Wu Yin, this is the five khandas, jie kong. That your five khandas are empty. What do we mean by five khandas? <coughs> the five khandas, Wu Yin, is what we perceive as us. In English, the ego, the I. To Sister Jennifer, she is very real. Her husband is very real. Everything is very real, very solid, seamless. So we don't think that it is something which is empty. But when you contemplate very deeply, you will see that the five khandas, what we perceive as I, as the ego, is empty of anything solid. Now the self or the ego is not an inherent concrete or absolute entity, but a temporary composite of matter and energy. In fact, this is the lion's roar of the sutra, that you must see the emptiness of the self this will shatter your strongest delusion 
our most beloved attachment is to this self. Even when we die, we don't want to let go of this self. And it is only when you can see the emptiness of this self, then you can transform your suffering. Now, if there is just one line you need to memorize to help you walk this path, it is actually the very first line of the Heart Sutra. Guan zi zai pu sa, xing shen, bo ro, bo lo, mi to shi. Zhao jian, wu yin jie kong. Because this one line helps you overcome all your pain and suffering. This is the lion's roar. This is the very, very fundamental of our Buddha Dharma. Now, the self or zi is an image that is created by our senses. The Buddha call it the five aggregates, the way we perceive. In Pali, you would have learned rupa, Nama. I prefer to call it Rupa Nama than Nama Rupa, and you will know what I mean as I go on. We are actually just processes which are ceaselessly in motion. But in our innocence, in our deluded view, we think we are a solid independent entity, and we call it I. Now, if our eyes can see beyond ultraviolet and below infrared, then certainly. Brother Joseph will not look like Brother Joseph. Brother Joseph will look probably something like this picture. But because I cannot see infrared and I cannot see ultraviolet, I can only see a very narrow spectrum. And I will see Sister Lena as what Sister Lena looks like. But if I had to use an infrared camera and look at Sister Lena, she will look something like that. Energy. Now the five khandas is what we use to perceive. Now, there's a myth. People think that when the Buddha talk about rupa nama or nama rupa, people separate the mind and the body into two different things. No, you can't separate the mind and the body into two different things because the mind is an activity of the body. If I do ask my primary school classmate Wing Sun, can you point to your mind, Wing Sun? You can't point to your mind. Point here, no, that's your brain, that's your head, that's your skull. You can't point to your mind because the mind is an activity, not an entity. So the Buddha taught us how it functions. And so the form in Bahasa, Rupa. And when you look at anything, when Sister Lina looks at me, she sees a Rupa and immediately the mind will work very rapidly there is sensation, perception, mental formation, and consciousness. This the Buddha teach us as the four components of how our mind perceive, construct, and label, and gives it a nama. So what is a nama? Those of you who are able to speak Malay are so lucky because Pali, Sanskrit, Malay have many, many words in common. A nama is literally a name. So the Sister Lina will name this image Dr. Wong. And in that sense, her perception of that form has been given an identity, a nama, a name. And now Sister Lina has created separateness. That means Dr. Wong is there, I'm here. What in psychiatry is called plurality. That means now you see things as separate. That is anatomically the function of our left lobe. If I had to remove Sister Lina's left lobe in her brain, she wouldn't perceive things like that. She won't see it as separate. So in Buddhism, this ego or I is a delusion of an independent self. Now in the culture and belief of the Buddhist time, they think that there is such a thing called an Atman. And this Atman is thought to be a permanent eye for all time, which goes from body to body to body to body to body, indestructible and eternal. Now, 
that belief is still held strongly by many people even today. But the Buddha saw that there is no such permanent substance within this that you call an I. The Buddha could only see ceaseless change and transformation. Hence, the Buddha gave the teaching of Anatman, the opposite with the word A-N added. In Pali, Anatman is Anatta, a word that you might be more familiar with. We are gushing streams of energy, like the picture of a river that I show you. And it is ceaselessly changing. Complexes of activities of body and mind, always in motion, always transforming from one state to another. Those that were before us extend back into the midst of time. And when we die, you will become those after you. From one arises another. What do I mean? You are literally going to be recycled. When you die, you're going to be recycled. Every atom, every amino acid, every carbon molecule. You're going to be recycled from life to life. From one arises another. So you are not the same, yet you are related. Because the next comes from now. The old identity is gone, habis. But a new identity arises. And Lego is actually a very useful way to teach this that the Buddha taught. When you take apart a Lego house and mix the pieces back in the bin, where does the house go? The child says, it's in the bin. The adult says, no, those are just pieces. They could now be reassembled into spaceships or train. The house was an arrangement. That arrangement doesn't stay with the pieces. It doesn't go anywhere else. It is gone. So when I die, I will be recycled into another form. If I've been a good person, Good karma, hopefully with good vipaka, I will be recycled into favorable conditions. But what is Dr. Wong will be gone. So if I'm a very bad person and I become a street dog, that street dog is not Dr. Wong. That street dog is a dog. Dr. Wong is gone. But that street dog is I came about because of Dr. Wong. Get it, Lena? you are literally recycled. So you are Kong, you are like a Lego man, or you're like an empty pail. Emptiness, Kong describes the callousness of all things. There is an external appearance that I know, Lina, that I know, Liming, but that is always changing. If you do not believe me, Sister Lina, take a look at your photograph when you are 20 years old. It's always changing. So the five khandas or the five aggregates are empty because what is seen or perceived by us as a solid entity that we label as self has actually no innate unchanging substance, no permanence. It's always changing. No inherent or independent eternal existence. Everything is produced from causes and is connected to and conditioned by everything else in a complex web of cause and effect. Nothing exists independently in an unchanging state. Now, we learn in the first noble truth. In the first noble truth, suffering, disease, disappointment, dissatisfaction, which we call dukkha, is present whenever you have clinging. You cannot cling to what is impermanent, unstable, unreliable, always changing, and non-self. Material and sensual happiness, because of all these characteristics, is fleeting. Now, the Buddha summarized Dukkha in the first noble truth by saying, Pancha Upadana Kanda Dukkha. The five clinging aggregates is suffering. As long as we cling, you are going to suffer. And the Buddha similarly compared form to a lump of foam, feeling to bubble, perception to mirage, 
mental formation to a banana trunk, consciousness to an illusion, and ask what essence could there be in this? So if you can understand this very first part of the sutta, seeing the emptiness of the self, seeing the emptiness of you, your son, your wife, your parents, seeing its non-self characteristic, then it will help you to transform your suffering. Do ku So, Wing Sun is my classmate from primary school. We have been friends for 40, 50 years. Wing Sun, do not expect your son-in-law to be as good a son-in-law as you are. Because your son-in-law is not you. Your son-in-law was raised in a different time, different culture, different education. He is not you. He is a composite of a different era. So he cannot be you. So if you cling into that concept that my son-in-law must be like this, like how I was as a son-in-law to my mother-in-law, then you're going to suffer. And your daughter is going to suffer. And every one of us is going to suffer. A concept also has to be let go of. So if you can first understand the very first part of the sutta, that the self is empty of anything permanent. Similarly, Wing Sun is empty of anything permanent. I am empty of anything permanent. We are all the time changing. Then you can transform your suffering and distress. The second noble truth teaches us that the cause of our suffering is craving. And craving is an emotion, an, an emotional state of wanting things, be it sensual pleasure, be it eternity and permanence. I put three dots there because that's very important. To see the causes of suffering, you must see first the emptiness of yourself, the nama rupa obtaining insightful understanding of the three characteristics of impermanence, suffering, and non-self. Now, many of us are of the age where we are all vaga amas. When you are vaga amas, you will have all kinds of illnesses. Do not blame your body. Do not blame your coronaries. Do not blame your prostate. What do you expect? It is impermanent. It is anicca. It is dukkha. And most importantly, it is non-self. You can't control it. It doesn't belong to you. Then you will realize the futility of craving, clinging, and greed. Hence, when you can let go, do ichie So this brings me back to the very first part, this first line, which we have just shared. If you can look within, and see the emptiness of yourself, the emptiness of your nama rupa, the emptiness of all that is surrounding you, your life, your wife, your lover, your friend, your brother, your sister, then you can let go and transform suffering and distress. Be a coward, part one. So if there's one lesson to bring home, that very first line, this is the very foundation, the lion's roar of the sutra. Now I mentioned about this, eternity and permanence. In the second noble truth, you have kamatanha. I want sensual pleasures. I want to enjoy. Then you have bawa tanha. Oh, it's something good. I want it to carry on forever. I want it to go on forever. Eternity. I want a, a eternity in heaven. An eternity or whatever. And then you go, we bawa tanha. No, I don't want it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. So eternity and permanence is something under bawa tanha, which we all crave for. And this was something the Buddha spoke very strongly on. This tale of eternal life in heaven is so quite blatantly and is a serious error which the Buddha had condemned unequivocally. In Majjhima Nikaya 22, 
the Buddha said, but self and what belongs to a self are not acknowledged as a genuine fact. This being so, is not the following a totally foolish teaching? And this is still being taught today. The self and the cosmos are one and the same. After death, I will be permanent, everlasting, eternal, imperishable, and will last forever and ever. This is being sold every day by people to you. And the Buddha said, is this not a totally foolish teaching? And the monks replied, what else could it be, sir? It's a totally foolish teaching. Because if you are to contemplate, look rationally, it is anything but this. Understanding emptiness, which is sunyata. Sunya is the adjective and the word anatta. Emptiness, sunyata, includes all the three universal characteristics. Anicca, dukkha, anatta. Impermanence, suffering, and non-self. Sunyata is all-encompassing view of this ultimate truth. In Chinese, we call it san fa ying. While anatta, anatta, non-self, is one aspect of this reality. All right? Now we go on to the second part. So if you refer to your notes, this is the second part, the next step in the teaching. So your first step in teaching is learning to see the emptiness of yourself through self-reflection, through looking into your mind, through looking very clearly. And seeing the emptiness of the five khandas. Then the next part, the next section. Oh, Sariputta. You know Sariputta is the chief disciple. Sir Li Zi. Sir Pu Yi Kong, Kong Pu Yi Se. Sir Chi Si Kong. Kong Chi Si Se. In English, the Rupa form is no other than emptiness. Emptiness, no other than form. Form is exactly emptiness. Emptiness is exactly form. This is probably the most popular and the most enigmatic line in this Heart Sutra. Many people will quote this when you say Heart Sutra. Oh, se pu yi kong, kong pu yi se, se chi se kong, kong chi se se. Form here, rupa, rupam or rupa. Form is no other than emptiness. That means form and emptiness are exactly the same. Form is exactly emptiness. Emptiness is no other than form. Emptiness is exactly form. This Second part is a very important teaching because the, the Dhamma that is being taught to you does not want you to go to the other extreme. Form we just discussed is the first, the Rupa. And this includes not only internally, but externally. Everything that you see from my table to my computer. And all form is empty, like a drum with no solid core. Constantly changing what we see what we perceive as permanent, it is not. It is not solid, it is not independent, it is not unchanging. So do not be surprised, Sister Lina, when your computer breaks down, when your computer gets a virus, when your software gets corrupted, because your computer is nothing solid, it's not independent, and it is not unchanging. With this knowledge of reality, the form that you perceive that we see exists as a temporary composite object. Linus computer still exists. So form is exactly emptiness. Emptiness is exactly form. So emptiness does not mean nothingness. Let me give you another example. A watch. A watch is empty of an inherent self. For within the aggregates of springs and gears, there's nothing in there which is a watch. But the combination of all this makes a watch that has a function that tells time. Our body and mind composite, rupa nama, is also the same. That's why the next line of the sutra says, so xiang xing shi, ren shi ni shi, so xiang xing shi, Yi Fu Ru Si, sensation, perception, mental formation, and consciousness 
认识你 ，I recognize you. It's exactly like this. So the four aggregates of how the mind construct and label, giving things a nama, a name or identity. This is similarly empty of any concrete existence. So it is not only the form, not only the rupam which is empty, but also the nama, what we label. That's also empty of any permanent concrete existence. So we function in an ephemeral environment. is always changing. All things are indeed real. Yes, Cicelina's computer is of course real. It is just not in the way she thinks it is. Cicelina expect her computer to last eternally. She expect the computer to always behave, never get corrupted, always function as she wants it. But the reality is otherwise, because it doesn't have any solid core. So the concept of nihilism, that things do not exist, and that nothing continues after death, and the concept of eternalism, that there is existence in objects that will exist unchangingly forever, they are both clearly rejected in the Buddha's teachings. And in the Heart Sutra, this is in this line. Form is no other than emptiness. Emptiness is no other than form. Form is exactly emptiness. Emptiness is exactly form. Lina, do you understand so far? Because I can only see a few people, so I can only see their reaction. Maybe Wing Sun, you should on your video so that I can see your reaction. All right. So far, Lina and Jennifer's video are on, so I can see their reaction. So please, this is to it tells us this teaching. So Zhu Fa Kong Xiang, Zhu Fa everything, everything. Zhu Fa everything. Me and you and a dog named Boo, from the computer to your book to your house to your car, everything is Kong Xiang. Xiang is Lakana. That means all of it. Is characterized by emptiness. That is empty of an unchanging nature. And knowing that all phenomena is empty of an unchanging nature, now you have insight into the changing nature of everything, and you will reach a very important part of this sutra, which teaches us: "Bu sen bu mie, bu gou bu jing, bu zhen bu jian." And this. Wing Sun, being a teacher of many years in chemistry, will tell me can tell you that this is fundamental science. Nothing in reality is created or destroyed, is defiled or pure. Nothing is added or lost. Bu shen bu mie, bu gou bu jing, bu zhen bu jian. And this is sixth form physics. Nothing is created. Nothing is destroyed. It is merely transformed from one state to another in an ever-flowing flux. The selflessness and the beginningless nature of all things. Clear. Now I come to this very important word because next, in the next part of this Heart Sutra, this word Wu starts to come in. In Japanese, it's mu, so you often hear mu. In Chinese, wu. Now, understanding this word is crucial. This word commonly we understand as no, non, or none. Wu. But in the Heart Sutra, it very importantly conveys the teaching of no grasping, clinging, or attachment. We function like a mirror. You receive, you relinquish all that goes in front of it without grasping or clinging. We function calmly, joyfully, full-heartedly, doing our best. We transcend the pleasant, unpleasant dichotomy and the futile efforts of resisting the monsters and holding on to the angels. And I'm going to show you something that is hardly ever taught, and that is this: the origin of the word "wu" is this. And it's a pictogram of a man or a woman, 
holding a lot of things in both hands. This is of course lost in the modern simplified version. Now, ironically, the word Wu in the Ha Sutra teaches the opposite, not to hold on to, not to grasp or to be attached. Dr. Quack, it doesn't mean not to have things. It means yes, Dr. Quack, you can have things, but you do not hold onto them. You do not grasp onto them. You have to let it go. So Wing soon you have to let go of your daughter whom you haven't seen for nine months. You have to learn to let it go or you will both suffer. Do not grasp onto them because all things are empty. We cannot control it. The character for Kong emptiness, its origin is a sky without clouds. So this is closer to describing the emptiness of a cup rather than a void. It is not nothing, but empty of any substance. Now this Wu is so important, I will have to repeat what I just said here again. You have a girl, a child, holding on to many things. That was the original word. Now in this teaching is not to hold on to things, not to grasp or be attached. Please remember this, very, very important, or you will not understand this sutra. If you look at your notes on the sutra, you will see the next line talks about, I better go back and repeat. Therefore, in emptiness, there is no form. Very important line. Therefore, in emptiness. So, with understanding now what we just shared on emptiness, therefore in emptiness, there is no form, no sensation, perception, mental formation, and consciousness. There, when you understand emptiness, you will understand that the five khandas, are empty. There are no coordinates by which you can define selfhood as these psychophysical activities that you see as self are constantly changing. At the end of these two hours, if Brother Joseph understood what I said, his thinking would be completely different. He's a different man. He's no longer the same as the Brother Joseph two hours ago. The word Wu do not grasp or cling onto the five khandas or what you perceive as yourself, or you will suffer. All right, accept it, use it, treat it, but do not cling. You have to let go. Therefore, with understanding emptiness, wu yan, er, bi, se, sen yi, no eye, no, no tongue, no body, no yan, yan jing, er, duo, bi, zi, mind. Your sense organs in Buddhism, the mind is a sixth sense organ. They provide you information. But what happens is reality we see distorted by our senses and we become deluded. But truth will be delusions now seen as what it truly is. And so these that you perceive, the eye will perceive form, ear will perceive sound, etc. No form, sound, smell, taste, object of touch, and object of talk. All these are empty. All our grasping attachment and aversions is generated and developed by the activities of our senses. The teaching here tells you, use them, but do not grasp onto them. 
the six perceived objects of form, sound, smell, taste, touch, and thought by our six senses, they are impermanent and unreliably distorted by our wishes, fears, and opinions. Look at this, a snake. No, it's a rope. But we will perceive it as a snake because that is what we fear. Even our objects of thoughts are just passing images and not I. It is not I think, therefore I am. This merely arises because of a cause. Now, Brother Whaley may say, hold on, hold on, my body clearly exists. I clearly have an eye, a ear, a nose. What is this teaching saying? With the realization of emptiness, your eye, ear, nose, etc. exist, but they do not exist in the way you conceive of it. No eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. These are just names. What do we mean by just a name? Can your eye exist by itself? If I were to take Brother Whaley's eye out, put it on the table, can that eye exist by itself and function? Can any of the others? No, none. Not a single one of them can function independently. They can only function as part of a whole. Hence, they are empty of any innate existence. And while it exists, it is by itself not a functional, independent entity. Once you separate it, it's gone. So therefore, with understanding emptiness, wu yan jie, nai zi wu yi si jie. This is a summary, yan jie, the realm of sight. Yi si jie, the realm of your consciousness. And this covers the six consciousness of eye, ear, nose, tongue, touch, and mind consciousness. It's telling you all these six things that we perceive, the six realms of whether we see, we hear, we taste, we touch. First, they are empty. They are not permanent. They are always changing. They are unreliable. They are unstable. And second, you should not take refuge in them. You should not hold on to them as I, my, or mine, or you will suffer. Who? You will realize, those of you who are smart, you will realize that I had just discussed the 18 datus. Six sense organs, six sense objects, and the six sense consciousness. That is the 18 datus. That is how we perceive. You have your five khandhas, how our mind function, consciousness, perception, formation, sensation with the rupa, the body, this being a function of the bodily organ. Then you have the six cognitive objects, what you see, what you hear, what you smell, etc. Your eye sees this, your ears hears that, the six faculties, and the six consciousness, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, what you see, what you hear, what you taste, etc. This is called the 18 datus. All of them are empty. They are not permanent, they are unstable, they are changing, they are unreliable. They do not have any concrete nature. And so please do not grasp onto it or attach onto it or you will suffer because they are unstable and unreliable. Now, this is how we perceive. All right, you see a dog and very quickly the mind will go through this process of cognition, we see a dog, we smell a dog, we hear a dog, etc. We recognize it. And very quickly, as we say just now, we will have a concept. We give it a name, a nama, a dog. And we have now created separation, duality, plurality. So there are three parts of our mental experience. You have your vinyana, our perception, you have your mano, our cognitive process, and we have chitta, our emotional reaction to it. For those who do not know, they grasp. Any one of us who do not know the teachings I just shared, you grasp onto what you hear, what you see, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch. You want it. You want it to be permanent. So the Buddha said, Take an uneducated, ordinary person who has not seen the Noble Ones, 
as is neither skilled nor trained in the teaching of the noble ones. They have not seen good persons and are neither skilled nor trained in the teaching of good person. Then they will consider form, feeling, perception, choices, whatever seen, heard, thought, known, sought, explored by the mind as, this is mine, I am this, this is myself. They will grasp onto it. In the Heart Sutra, it tells you, Wu, do not grasp onto the 18 Datus. Do not grasp onto the five Khandas, or you will suffer. <clears throat> but an educated, noble disciple will do the opposite. He will see the form and he will say, this is not mine, I am not this, this is not myself. Similarly, for feeling, perception, etc., this is not mine, I am not this, this is not myself. So those who know, they do not grasp. They have learned this teaching. <coughs> Clear? So when we see the un and understand the truth of emptiness, the result is the transformation of the way we think. You awaken to reality. There will still be pain. Your body will still age. Your back will still give you pain. Your boss will give, give, still give you distress, but it will lessen because you know. You know how to deal with it. You learn not to be taken in by the appearance of things and freedom from suffering comes from not clinging to an ever-changing slippery object and relying on it as a source of happiness. So emptiness as a quality of phenomena means you cannot see anything as concrete and as yourself. Emptiness as a mental state means when you look, you do not add onto what you look. In the Bahia Sutta, it is said, in what is seen, only the seen. What is heard, only the heard. And what is cognized, only the cognized. And Bahia became enlightened on just listening to this one teaching of the Buddha in this one line, because he has learned how to perceive. So emptiness is a mode of perception will remove all that I, my, mind, like, dislike. So please know, emptiness is not a metaphysical view, but a strategic mode of acting and seeing the world that helps you have less pain. Now, all things are ever evolving and ever changing. We know that. Emptiness, which is conceptually liable to be mistaken for nothingness and that you know is not true, is in fact the reservoir of infinite possibilities. Remember, I shared with great detail, it is not emptiness. It is just not something permanent, unchanging with a concrete core. In the Sunya Sutta, in the Pali Canon, Ananda asked, it is said that the world is empty, the world is empty, Lord. In what respect is the world empty? And the Buddha replied, in so far as it is empty of a self or anything pertaining to the self, that is why the world is empty. And here you will see the Buddha clearly describe it as both internal and external, not just within, but everything you see outside. And of course, in the Dhammapada, you have this line, Sabbe Dhamma Anatta. Dhamma, when written in small d, means phenomena. All phenomena are non or not self. Now, look, look at this example. A candle that we offer all the time. Now, this candle says, I'm the fire. I am beautiful and bright. I'm great and powerful. I can give light, burn or boil. Now, like the candle flame, we too often say this, I'm this, I'm that, right? Now you may laugh at the candle and say how stupid, how ridiculous. The candle is just a composite of many factors, just energy. There is no I inside the candle, nothing solid or eternal or unchanging. But we are exactly the same like this candle, nothing solid, eternal or unchanging. We are just activities, just energy, no solid activity. Emptiness, home, no solid entity. We say, I am happy. We say, I am suffering. In reality, there is happiness. There is suffering. 
but there is no solid eye. And we are just like that candle flame without the eye. We are just energy, heat, combustion. You say when you die, you become cold. No more heat, no more combustion. So some people say that Buddhist practice is to dissolve the self. That is wrong. They do not understand. There is no self to be dissolved. There is only the notion of self to be transcended. And that is what I've spent one hour and 15 minutes trying to share. Now, you have the truth of change, which we have understood. Then you have the truth of becoming. Everything is always in the process of becoming into something else. I am becoming older by the second, by the hour. Nothing is, but it's becoming. Everything is always changing. And this is the emptiness of nature. It is always becoming something. This is impermanence. Wu Chang, one of the first, the first of the three universal characteristics. Therefore, with understanding emptiness, the next line, uh, the next part of the sutta, therefore, with understanding emptiness, Wu Wu Ming Yi Wu Wu Ming Jing, Nai Zi Wu Lao Shi Yi Wu Lao Shi Jing. Wu Ming is ignorance. Wu Ming. Don't understand. Ignorance. Don't understand. Lao si, old age and death. Therefore, with understanding emptiness, there is no ignorance. Now you know. And there's also no ending of ignorance. Up to no old age and death. I've just taught you. And also no ending of old age and death. And again, for those of you who know, this is the 12 links of dependent origination. Starting with ignorance and ending with Lao, Shi, O H and death. In one line, it has summarized the entire 12 link dependent origination. So when enlightened to the truth, Sister Lina, there is no more ignorance. Sister Li Ming now knows she's no more ignorant. And ultimately, because there's no permanent Sister Lina, no permanent sister leaving. There's no being even to be ignorant or to end ignorance. No one to age and die. And of course, dependent origination teaches us that each is dependent on the previous link. We are all interrelated to each other. Samyutta Nikaya 515, no death. One who regards the world in what way isn't seen by death's king. And the Buddha replied, always be mindful. Regard the world as empty, having removed my view in terms of self. Having removed any view in terms of self. This way one is above and beyond death. One who regards the world in this way isn't seen by death's door. Understand? In conventional language, there is birth, there is death. In ultimate reality, Sister Lina is recycled. There is no birth, no death, no Lina. Therefore, with understanding emptiness, Wu Ku Ji Mie Tao. Again, those of you who are knowledgeable, this is the Four Noble Truths. Wu Ku Ji Mie Tao. Therefore, with understanding emptiness, there is no suffering. No source of suffering, no annihilation, no path. Now the Four Noble Truths tells us the nature of suffering, the cause of suffering, the path to end suffering and to attain Nirvana. Now on reaching enlightenment, there is no more psychological suffering, stress and grief. When the Buddha became enlightened at the age of 35, there is no more psychological suffering. With final Nirvana, when the Buddha passed away at the age of 80, there is now no more physical suffering as he is not going to be recycled into another physical form again. No more, the end of physical suffering. From the enlightened viewpoint, even the path is conceptual for there is no unchanging entity that has walked the path. Sister Lina who walked the path in Indonesia is a completely different person from the Sister Lina who was working in Singapore and a completely different person 
from the sister Lina who is in Johor Bahru now. If you don't believe me, sister Jennifer, just take a look at your old photographs. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ago, who is that person? Unrecognizable. Only a flux of activities. Now in the Visudhi Maga, you will see this line. If you understand this gata, you understand what I'm trying to share with you so far. In the Visudhi Maga, for there is suffering, but none who suffers. No one. Because we tend to think of a permanent sister Jennifer, a permanent brother Joseph, a permanent brother Whaley, but there is no permanent Whaley, no permanent Joseph, only activities. Doing exists, although there is no doer. The emptiness of self. Extinction is, but no extinguished person. So Nirvana is, but no one who enters Nirvana. Although there is a path, there is no goal. Because there's no permanent, concrete self that we always think exists. And this is our biggest delusion. The most difficult attachment and delusion to break. Now the Buddha in Majjhima Nikaya 22 said, there are certain ascetics who accuse him that the ascetic Gautama is an exterminator. He advocates the annihilation, eradication and obliteration of an existing being. They do not understand and they falsely misrepresent the Buddha. This is exactly like what the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh said. People think that the Buddha is dissolving or destroying or getting rid of the self. They do not understand that in the very first place, there is no self to be dissolved. Only the notion of self to be transcended. This being so, if others abuse, attack, harass, and trouble the realized one, he doesn't get resentful, bitter, and emotionally exasperated. Or if others honor, respect, revere, and venerate him, he doesn't get thrilled, elated, and emotionally excited. This is going to come in the next part of the Heart Sutra. Maybe we will take a three minute break here because now this next section deals with how do you apply that understanding of emptiness into your daily life now. And so I think that this is a good time for you to quickly run to the toilet or drink your cup of coffee. I'll see you in three minutes. <laughs>